Okay, today we're going to be talking about quadratic surfaces. And a quadratic surface is any graph of an equation like this. Okay, which looks intimidating, but don't be worried about it. We're only going to do six types, and I'm going to uh, spell out for you how you can work with each type. Okay, so first of all, the six that we're going to look at are the ones where specifically D, E, and F are zero. Okay, which means you won't have a term with X, Y, and you won't have a term with X, Z, and you won't have a term with yz. Okay, what you have is you have a term for each variable squared, a term for each variable to the first power, and a constant term set equal to zero. Okay, now one of those might be missing too because for instance let's say b might be zero in which case there wouldn't be a y squared term. Okay, those are the things we're going to look at. Now there are six different types and I'm just going to go, go, them, go through them with you one at a time. Okay, now the first type It's called an elliptic paraboloid, which looks like this. Okay, now I want you to look up here at what this says. It says the equation is z equals x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. That's called the standard form. for an elliptic paraboloid. Okay. The important thing is this. Here's what I want you to notice. Okay, I want you to notice that it has an x squared term, a y squared term, and a z to the first. Okay, specifically, this is what's important there's no z squared. Okay, now I'm going to make that a little bit more general. Okay, let me write this down. One of the variables has no squared term. And also, there's no constant term. Okay, that's how you know it's an elliptic paraboloid. One of the variables has no squared term, and there's no constant term. Okay. All right. I will show you how to link an equation like that in yellow to an equation like this. Okay. 
But first, first let's look at the graph. Okay. I'm going to erase what's written in red, so please remember that, okay? Elliptic paraboloid happens when one of the variables has no squared term and there's no constant term, okay? All right. Now, how do we figure out that the graph will look something like that? Here's what you do. You look at the traces. Okay, if we were to plug in, let's say, x equals 0, okay, then let's see what we would get. If we were to plug in x equals 0, then we would get z equals y squared over b squared. Well, you should know that that's the equation of a parabola in the zy plane. And in fact, it is right here. Oops, that's not the color I wanted. Just a second here. That's right here. Can you see that? That parabola right there is in the z y plane. That's what it means when you set x equal to 0. It means you're flattening everything down into the z y plane. And you would get z equals y squared over b squared. b is just a number. Okay? So in other words, what you have there is z equals a number times y squared. And that number would be 1 over b squared. Okay? And that's a parabola. So we call that the trace in the plane x equals d. I'm sorry, x equals 0 is what I meant to say. Okay? But I want to point out, though, that if x did equal something other than 0, so let's write now x equals d, where d is just a number. Let's write x equals d. Um, maybe, in fact, let's use an actual number. Why don't we write x equals 2? Then we would have z equals 2 squared over a squared, which is just a number, plus y squared over b squared, which is also a parabola. It's a number times y squared, that's a parabola, plus some other number. So that would be a parabola that is shifted upwards a distance of 4 over a squared. Okay, so if you come out here, the trace is a parabola as well. Can you see that maybe? Yeah, I think that shows up pretty good in the picture. Okay, the bottom line is written right here. If you look at the plane, x equals d. So that's a plane parallel to the yz plane. And you slice this uh, surface, you will see a parabola. Okay? All right, now let's look at the trace in the xz plane. That means we set y equal to 0. Then we get z equals a number times x squared. That's a parabola in the xz plane, and that's right here. Okay. And what's it tell us right here? If you substitute any number for d, y equals d, you'll get a plane parallel to the xz plane. And if you do that, 
the trace will be a parabola. So if you look at this thing from the front, meaning looking down the x-axis, looking parallel to the x-axis, and you slice this thing, you will get parabolas. Uh, let me do this a little better here. If you slice this thing parallel to the uh, perpendicular rather to the x-axis, you get parabolas. Okay, if you slice it perpendicular to the y-axis, you get parabolas. Okay, now what if you slice it perpendicular to the z-axis? This is something totally different then. Let's plug in z equals zero. What do we have then? Then we have zero equals x squared over a number plus y squared over a number, which means x and y both have to be zero. So you just have this one point right there, the origin. That's called the vertex of the elliptic paraboloid. But if you plug in any other number, like let's say we plug in the number 3, z equals 3. Then you would get 3 equals x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. Well, you should recognize that that is an ellipse. It might be easier for you to recognize that if you divide everything by 3, because then you will see x squared over a number plus y squared over a number equals 1. And that's the equation of an ellipse, isn't it? And do you see that here? If you look straight down the z-axis and you slice this thing, you're going to see an ellipse. The larger z is, the larger the ellipse is going to be. And that's because if this number is bigger, then these numbers down here will be bigger. And if you know your ellipses, then that makes the ellipse bigger. Okay. And in fact, the square roots of these two numbers tell you the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts of the ellipse. Okay, so let's practice something here really quickly. So by the way, so you see that right there? The trace in the z directions are looking down the z-axis. That's the traces perpendicular to or parallel to the uh, xy plane. The traces will be ellipse. Okay. Now, so let's look at an equation here. What if, what if I were to put z equals x squared over nine plus y squared over 16. Okay, and what if I said find the trace in the z equals 4 plane. Okay, so here's what you would need to do. You need to substitute in a 4 for z. I would divide everything by 4. We get x squared over 36 plus y squared over 64 
equals 1. So in other words, that's x squared over 6 squared plus y squared over 8 squared equals 1. So the trace in the z equals 4 plane is going to be an ellipse with x-intercepts Let me change that word. Instead of saying x-intercepts, why don't we say width of 6 um, plus or minus 6, which means 12, okay? 6 on either direction, so width of 12 in the x direction. And width of 8 in either direction, so 16 in the y direction. Okay? Now you can have something like this. Let's go back up here. You can have something like this. z equals not just x squared over a number, but something like x minus let's say h squared over a number plus y minus k squared over a number. And in that case, the vertex right here would not be at the origin. It would be at hk on the xy plane, so that would be the point hk0. Okay. Now I said um, you wouldn't have a constant term in an elliptic paraboloid, but I realize you actually, you actually can have a constant term because over here, where the z is, it might say z minus a number, like let's say j. In that case, the vertex would be at the point HKJ. Okay, you're going to want to, um, you know, mess around with these things. It doesn't have to be Z that does not have a squared term. You could have something like this. Just give me a second to erase some stuff. You could have an elliptic paraboloid like this. x equals y squared over a number plus z squared over a number. In that case, you're going to have an elliptic paraboloid that opens up along the x-axis. OK? You could have negative x equals y squared over an over plus z squared over an over, and then you'll have an elliptic paraboloid that opens up along the x-axis, pointing backward instead of forwards. So there's lots of different um, combinations, but what's very important is for you to realize that when one of the variables does not have a square to term, but the other two variables do, then you're going to have an elliptic parabola paraboloid. Okay? And the traces will be parabolas in both in both cases of the variables that have quadratic terms. Okay? And the traces will be ellipses in the case, the direction of the variable that does not have a quadratic term. Okay? All right, let's move on here. 
Next is an elliptic cone. How do you notice this equation here is different from an elliptic paraboloid? So there you see that z squared, x squared, and y squared all show up. And we can arrange it so that it says z squared equals the sums of the other two variables squared divided by numbers. Okay, in that case you're going to get an elliptic cone. All right, if you plug in x equals 0, what are we going to get? We'll get z squared equals 0 plus y squared over b squared, which means z equals plus or minus y over b. Well, those are two straight lines, aren't they? That both go through the origin. One has a slope of 1 over b, and the other one has a slope of negative 1 over b. OK, look at, uh, look at this one here. If you plug in y equals 0, similar thing happens. Then you get z squared equals x squared over a squared. So z equals plus or minus x over a. That's two crossing lines. Here they are in this picture right here. Here's one of them. That is the line x equals negative, I mean z equals negative x over a, and here's the line z equals positive x over a. Okay? Now if you move out from there, look what it says here. If you put in x equals d, then look at what you get, where d is not zero. Okay, then look at what you get. You get z squared equals a number plus y squared over a number, right? And if you were to rearrange things, let's see what we would have here. You would have z squared minus y squared over b squared equals d over a squared. Let's multiply both sides by a over d squared. You would get c squared divided by d over a squared minus y squared divided by b d over a squared equals 1. And if you recognize that, that's the equation of a hyperbola. And here's a picture of one right here. If you slice this thing with a plane straight up and down, this is what I want you to get. If you slice one of these with a plane straight up and down, through the origin, you'll get crossed lines. Let me draw that in this picture over here on the left. If you slice it with a plane straight up and down through the origin, you'll get a pair of crossed lines. If you slice one of these with a plane straight up and down that doesn't go through the origin, you will get a hyperbola. Okay. Now, if you cut one of these with a plane that is horizontal, what do you think you're going to get then? You're going to get 
two ellipses. And the reason why is because if you have a horizontal plane that looks like this, z equals a number, okay, and then our equation will become this, a number squared equals x squared over a number squared plus y squared over a number squared, okay, and that's the same thing as saying x squared over a over d squared plus y squared over b over d squared equals 1. And you might recognize that that's the equation of an ellipse. OK. Now obviously, or I guess it's obvious in this equation, if you swap the x squared and the z squared, then this thing is going to open up along the x-axis instead of the z-axis. If you swap the z squared and the y squared, it'll open up along the y-axis instead of the z-axis. There's lots of different possibilities of orienting this. Okay. And one other thing I'll say really quick before we move on is you could have something like this z squared equals not just x squared over a squared, but something like this, x minus 7 squared over a squared, plus maybe y minus 2 squared over b squared, okay? In which case, this thing would be shifted so that the axis running through the middle would not go right through the origin, it would be shifted over so that it would be going straight up and down but passing through the point 7, 2 in the x-y axis. Okay? And seeing this sometimes requires completing the square. We're going to do an example like that. But let me show you the other four types before we get to any examples. Okay, the next type is called an ellipsoid. This is, in some sense, the easiest one, I think. It's kind of like a rugby ball. The equations of an ellipsoid looks like this. All three terms have a squared term, and they can be arranged so that it looks like the sums of the three squared terms, each divided by a number, equals 1. And this one is, I think, the easiest because the traces in all three directions are ellipses. Okay, and the reason why to see that is, um, let's just take a number and put it in for x. then you would get this. Okay. Well, I can, I can move this to the other side. The t squared over a squared. You can write 1 minus d squared over a squared. Okay. And then I can divide by this number. And what would we get then? So, sorry, this is now gone because I moved it to the other side. Okay, so what would we get if we divided by that number that's on the um, on the right? First of all, let's write that 1 minus d squared over a squared. Let's write that as a squared minus d squared over a squared. Yeah, that's a bit better. So do you see that that's the same thing as saying y squared over a number
plus z squared over a number. That should have been a c there. equals 1, and that's the equation of an ellipse. But there is a little bit of a catch. If d is bigger than a, then these numbers on the bottom would be negative, in which case you don't have an ellipse, you have nothing. And that's why if you move too far out along the x-axis, the thing starts to just disappear then, right? It only exists for a certain distance. And after that, it disappears. And let's look at this distance, by the way. This is a and negative a on the x-axis. b and negative b on the y-axis c and negative c on the z-axis. So you see these numbers down here. Let me get rid of this stuff, okay? <coughs> these numbers down here actually tell you <coughs> the width in the x direction, the width in the y direction, and the width in the z direction. Okay? All right, let's move on. Next type is called a hyperboloid of one sheet. That looks like this. x squared over a number plus y squared over a number minus this time z squared over a number. And you get this shape right here. Okay. The variable that has the minus in front of it that's going to be the axis that runs down the middle. Okay, the traces in the uh, parallel to the zy plane, or if you want to say perpendicular to the x-axis, the traces are hyperbolas. Okay. The traces that are perpendicular to the y-axis are also hyperbolas. And the traces perpendicular to the z-axis are ellipses. Okay. That, by the way, is a surface of revolution. If you take, if you take this hyperbola and spin it around the z-axis, you get this hyperboloid of one sheet. Now, there's something called a hyperboloid of two sheets. That's like this. That's when you take a hyperbola oriented this way and spin it around the z-axis. And you can tell that kind of an equation because there's two minus signs instead of one. <coughs> okay. The traces perpendicular to the x-axis are hyperbolas. The traces perpendicular to the y-axis are hyperbolas. And the traces perpendicular to the z-axis are ellipses. But notice there's nothing in this area here. That means there's nothing between c and negative c on the z-axis. And that's because if you were to take a number smaller than c and try to plug it into the equation in place of z, then you're going to get something with no solutions.
Let me show you what I mean. Suppose we had z squared over 16 minus x squared over 4 minus y squared over 5 equals 1. So what is c in this case? It's 4, right? 16 is 4 squared. If I took a number that's smaller than 4, like let's take the number 3, and I plugged it in here, you would get 9 sixteenths minus this, minus this, equals 1. Let's subtract 9 sixteenths from both sides. And you see what you have, a negative number here, because that must be negative, mustn't it? Equals a positive number here, and that's impossible. So this, this equation there does not correspond to any points with a z value less than 4. So between positive and negative 4 on the z-axis here. In the z direction, there would be no points at all. Okay. All right, and then the last kind of quadratic surface we're going to look at is called a hyperbolic paraboloid. Some people call it a saddle for obvious reasons. It looks like a horse's saddle. And that's an equation that can be written this way. Notice there's no z squared here, so it looks very similar to the first one we saw, the elliptic paraboloid. Let's look back at the elliptic paraboloid. Look at this. Okay, z squared equals x squared over a number plus y squared over a number. Now look at how the saddle equation is different. For the saddle equation, we have z equals x squared over a number minus y squared over a number. So it's that minus sign that gives you a saddle instead of an elliptic paraboloid. Okay. And the traces perpendicular to the x-axis will be parabolas. The traces perpendicular to the y-axis will be parabolas. But the traces perpendicular to the z-axis are difficult to draw, but they are hyperbolas. OK? And that's all listed here. These tables are straight out of the book. These pictures with these tables here, like I'm highlighting right now, are all in the book. You should look at them to um, to to classify these things. Because in the homework, you're going to be given equations. You're going to be asked, what kind of surface is it? Okay, things like that. So you're going to want to look at these pictures in the book. That's where I got all this information from in these pictures, is right out of the book. Okay, so you're going to be given... Lots of different equations that say, what kind of surface is this? Or put it into standard form, or things like that. Okay, and I want to do two, I want to do two questions with you. I don't want to just leave you hanging there um, to figure out the questions. I, I want to do some with you. Some, some of them are very, very easy. They just give you an equation and say, what kind of surface is this? That's not difficult. But some of the questions are a little bit harder. So I want to work through a, a couple of questions with you here, okay? <clears throat> okay, let's look at this question here. Find the center of the ellipsoid, and then they give you an equation. Looks pretty complicated, doesn't it? And by the way, how do you even know if it, how do you even know it is an ellipsoid? And how do you find the center? Well, the trick is you put it into standard form. And I'm going to show you how to do that because it's going to require completing the square. Okay? So let's do this. Let's set it up. Let's put the x terms, 25x squared. 
and minus 100x together. Well, I'll leave myself a little space. Let's put the y terms, 16y squared minus 128y. Let's put those together. And let's put together 4z squared uh, plus 24z. And then let's put the 8 on the other side. That's how I like to do it when I'm going to complete the square. OK, for the x's, let's factor out a 25. For the y's, we'll factor out 16. And for the z's, we'll factor out 4. Everybody should know how to complete the square, and that's all I'm doing. OK, now, what do I add in these three spots? So for the first one, I take half of 4, which is 2, and square it, I'm going to add in a 4. Whatever I add to the left, I have to add to the right. But here's the catch. How much did I really just add in? I wrote 4 right there, but where did I write it? I wrote it in some parentheses that are being multiplied by 25. So when I put that 4 in there, I really added 100 to that side, didn't I? So I better add 100 to the other side, too. OK, what goes in the next spot? We take half of 8, which is 4, square it. It's 16 by putting that 16 in there, which is going to be multiplied times the 16. I really just added 256. And now what goes in the Z spot? Take half of 6, which is 3, square it, that's 9. By putting this 9 there, which is getting multiplied by the 4, I really just added 36 to the left. So I also add 36 to the right. So what we have now is 25 times x minus 2 squared plus 16 times y minus 4 squared plus 4 times z plus 3 squared equals, how much is that over there? We have 400 on the right. Okay. Now, here's how I know it's an ellipsoid. Look at what we have here. Three quadratics added together equals a number. Of the six things we looked at, which ones involve three quadratics added together equals a number? Let's just go through the list. Is a saddle three quadratics added together equals a number? No, it's not. It's only two quadratics. This is not a saddle. Is a hyperboloid of two sheets three quadratics added together equals a number? No, it's not. We have two of them are minus signs. So it's not a hyperboloid of two sheets. Is it a hyperboloid of one sheet? No, because that's not three quadratics added together equals a number. There's a minus right there. So it's not a hyperboloid of one sheet. Is it an ellipsoid? There's three quadratics added together equals a number. So it could be an ellipsoid. Let's check the remaining ones, though. Maybe there's other possibilities. An elliptic cone, is that three quadratics added together equal a number? No, there are three quadratics, but if I put them all on the same side, 
at least one of them would have a minus sign in front of it, right? So it's not an elliptic cone. And it's not an elliptic paraboloid because that only has two quadratic terms. So the only one that was a possibility was ellipsoid. That's how I know it's an ellipsoid. Okay. Now it asked us to find the center, and we're going to do that. It's very important. This needs to be a 1. So let's go back to what we have, because we don't have a 1 there. We have a 400. So before I can tell the center, well, you might be able to guess right now what the center is, but let's, let's do the problem thoroughly, okay? Let's put it into standard form. You're going to have some problems that say, put this into standard form, and that's what we're doing right now. So I want to complete that, okay? I need to divide both sides by 400. So that I have a 1 on the right. And here's what you're going to end up with. x minus 2 squared over 16 plus y minus 4 squared over 25 plus z plus 3 squared over 100 equals 1. So we have an ellipsoid with center and now you can see the center look x minus 2 means the x coordinate of the center is 2 y minus 4 means the y coordinate of the center is 4 and z plus 3 means the z coordinate of the center is minus 3 so there's the center okay and it doesn't ask us this but let me just tell you what the numbers on the bottom tells you 4 is the the radius at the widest part in the x direction so that means the width in the x direction is 8 this 5 tells you the radius at the widest part in the y direction is 5 so the width in the y direction is 10 and this 10 tells you the radius in the widest part of the z direction is 10, so the height of this ellipsoid is 100. Okay. Okay, here's another, here's another question. Okay, let's look at this problem. Find the x, y, and z intercepts of this equation. Okay. Now notice there's no completing the square that has to be done here because there's an x squared but no x. There's a y squared but no y. There's a z squared but no z. So there's no completing the square that needs to be done. Notice there's three quadratics added together and if I move the 36 over I will have three quadratics added together equals a number. Once again, that's an ellipsoid. I would like a 1 right there. So let's divide everything by 36. We get x squared divided by 9 plus y squared divided by 4 sorry, 4, which is 2 squared, plus z squared divided by 3, which is the square root of 3 squared, equals 1. So now it's very easy to answer this. The x-intercepts are 
plus and minus 3, 0, 0. The y-intercepts are 0, plus and minus 2, 0. And the z-intercepts are 0, 0, plus and minus square root of 3. It's just from these three numbers and the fact that the center is at the origin. Why is the center at the origin? Because on the top, <clears throat> it's just x squared, y squared, z squared, not x minus something squared. Or if you want to, you could say it's x minus 0 squared, y minus 0 squared, z minus 0 squared. So the center is 0, 0, 0. I'll even write that down, even though it didn't ask. Okay? All right, one other type of question you'll be asked is questions like this. Find the standard equation of an ellipsoid centered at the origin and passing through those three points. Okay, so this is not too hard at all, actually. Let's think about it. Ellipsoid means we're going to have three quadratics added together equals 1. Okay. And there will be something squared on the bottom of each of those. Okay, now, centered at the origin tells us that on the top we're just going to have x squared, y squared, z squared. It's x minus 0 squared, y minus 0 squared, z minus 0 squared, because the center is 0, 0, 0. Okay, now let's look at those three points. These two are where I want to start, because notice that 0, 0, 4, that's a z-intercept, isn't it? That tells me that this number under the z squared is going to be 4 squared. 0, 2, 0 is a y-intercept, so that tells me the number under y squared is going to be 2 squared. The only number I don't know is this one. I will plug in that third point to find that number that I labeled with a question mark. Okay, we're going to get 1 squared over question mark squared plus root 3 squared over 2 squared plus square root of 7 halves squared over 4 squared equals 1. So that's 1 over question mark squared plus 3 fourths plus 7 halves divided by 16 will be 7 30 seconds. Okay, equals 1. This is just basic algebra here. Let's see, if we add those together, I believe we're going to get 31 over 32. Equals 1. So 1 over question mark squared equals 1 over 32. which means question mark squared equals 32. And that's really all I need, by the way, because that's what goes down here is question mark squared. I don't actually need to find question mark. I just needed to find question mark squared. See, actually, let me look at the next line down. See right there? And now I know that the bottom of the first fraction is a 32. Oh, sorry, let me actually, I'm sorry, that might have been confusing because we have those numbers 1, 3, and 7 on the top, so I'm sorry, I should have actually looked look up here. 
the bottom of the first fraction is question mark squared. It's 32. So we have our answer x squared over 32 plus y squared over 4 plus z squared over 16 equals 1. That's our answer. That's the ellipsoid that they asked for. Centered at the origin and passing through those three points they gave us. Okay, so you're going to be asked to do questions like those three and then a whole bunch of questions of just, you know, is is this equation an ellipsoid or a hyperboloid of one sheet or whatever? And the trick there is to just put them into standard form. Okay, and that'll give you a lot of matching up of pictures with equations. And you just have to look at what type of equation is it? So what should the picture look like? Okay. Takes a little bit of work, but those questions I think are pretty straightforward if you're willing to just think about what you're given. The harder questions are the kinds that I worked out with you, and so now you see how to do those. All right, have a good afternoon.